mum Julie. Hello, I'm Lucy's mum and we've got a very special video for you today. Americans remember Britain in the 90s. An American love story comes to Britain. We have our very good friends Georgiana and Terry. Yay! Hi y'all, <laughs> how y'all doing? I'm Terry, otherwise known as the Murph. My name's Georgiana, and I'm his wife. Can you tell us a little bit about how you guys met? Our stars crossed. I was living in western New York and working in Niagara Falls as a school psychologist. He was in Florida, retired from his Air Force career, and working in some aerospace type of job. And I met my girlfriends out for dinner, and he happened to be in western New York in Buffalo on a business trip. One of my friends had actually dated the guy he was with. He was in town for an extended period of time and we saw each other practically every single day for the better part of, what, a week, two weeks almost. He sailed off to Florida, called me up and said, you know, I've been thinking about you, I miss you. If I pay your way, will you come to Florida and visit me? I consulted with my friend and she said, I don't think you're stupid, go. <laughs> so we went down and we drove around Florida visiting different Air Force bases. And during the course of that drive, he got a phone call that said, we'd like you to come up to Western New York. I was the director in Florida and they wanted me to move up to Buffalo. Whoa. Whoa. It's meant to be. What was the chance of that happening? Your kismet. Yeah. <laughs> that gave us an opportunity to get to know each other better while he was working. After one year there, by golly, didn't he get another job that took us to Baltimore. I had to wait a year in order to be able to move because of credentialing. We married in Baltimore. From there, he got a position out here in Arizona. I fortunately was able to come with him this time. <laughs> <laughs> He did an awful lot of out-of-state travel for business because it was, you know, international aerospace industries. So all over the United States, but also to Asia, to Germany, to England. <laughs> I'll let him tell you about the business trip. You can start and then I take over. <laughs> As usual. <laughs> I was invited by British Aerospace to come over and talk about a new system, uh, electronic warfare that we were involved with. British Aerospace and the Americans work very closely together. England is, after all, our mother country. We were staying at Lancaster Gate, just off Hyde Park. I was invited to go to Westminster to the Churchill Room for dinner. Wow. With this fellow who was the Order of the British Empire, you know. OB. So we had a nice dinner and so forth. The only thing of conflict that came up was I said, when the wine list came, I said, I notice on the list, you don't have any French wine and you don't have any California wine. Most of us Australian. I said, I think you ought to try California wines, Napa Valley. I mean, they're really good. And I says, it's made by Americans. And I'm quite sure that there's a few Brits over there that tasted more than one or two. And uh, <laughs> he says to me, he said, that sounds like a damn good idea. And now I found out years later, they serve California wine in the Churchill room. I love Winston Churchill, by the way, you know that. This statue of Winnie was there overlooking our dinner. What was really neat was I had this little card, you know, engraved and so forth. I walked up to a, one of the beef eaters in plain clothes, you know. The crowd was stretched back back for hundreds of yards, you know, people wanting to get in. And I just walked right up to the front and presented this card and he says, yes, sir, off I go. And these people are going, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who he was. So. Yeah. It was June, July of 1993. I had not been to the British Isles. He's old hand and I'm not. So I'm, you know, kind of trepidatious about the whole thing. He was in England doing his business for a week. We planned that I would come and join him, ride my first British Air plane and had my first scones and clotted cream. I land at Gatwick and had my big girl knickers on 
had my directions from him, what train to take by myself, find the train, what station to get off by myself. I come up out of the station, dragon luggage, and there he is waiting, waiting for me with our standard black British cap. What amused me to pieces as I'm sitting jet lagged in the back seat, he's jabbering away with the driver. I'm listening and I'm listening. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> the driver was from East Putney. I was yeah. like, oh yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> so the driver and I became great friends. He said, wherever you want to go, whenever you call this number. So we made use of that a number of times. Anyways, getting used to all that as far as culture shock, but in an English speaking country. After I got over my jet lag and into our incredibly small elevator in the building, it really could only hold me and our luggage to get to the floor. He had to go the stairs. We had to step out onto the muse so we could see down the alley. She says, now I understand what a muse is. He dragged me everywhere. I saw Westminster Abbey, the Queen's Palace. She was there. There were the guard with his big bear hat on. Um, <laughs> things that I had read about, you know. It was wonderful to see so many things that I'd only seen in movies or read about in books or magazines. It filled a hole in my historical part of my mind and heart. We did ultimately make our way out of the city. I was cold the whole time. And I came from Baltimore, which is hot and humid. All I had was a summer weight wool blazer. So that's the only thing I had to keep my poor body warm. When we did make that visit to the North Sea, coldest 4th of July ever, <laughs> ever. In summertime, you can't depend on the weather. It's no. so changeable. What amazed me is there was a little tea shop. We stopped to have a snack and it overlooked down to the beach. I looked down and I go, oh my God, there are people in their bathing suits and they have these one or two foot high reflector shields all the way around their bodies to get sun tans. And it is July after all, but it was also probably about 50 some degrees. And it was 53 degrees. And they were right next to the water and I'm going, that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> That's British. That, is, that, is, that just sums up. That is the, the British, British. summer time. Had my scary things happen too. Carrie Ooh. rented a car and it mm -hmm. was my first driving, not me personally driving, but being a passenger in a car that's on the opposite side of the road than I'm used to. And he's zipping around and <laughs> going down these narrow roads and there's hedgerows. And I'm going like this because it looks like it's gonna come through the windshield and so we're so close. And then don't we have to go through some of those turnarounds, this roundabouts. That was, I think, my most terrifying part of the trip. But the train, oh my goodness. He yeah, has a first class ticket. We were doing posh. <laughs> you were indeed. I enjoyed the train very much, I have to say. So, yeah. Not, not the car. Uh, <laughs> and then we decided one day to really be upper crust and went to the, was the Hilton we went to and had Hilton. breakfast. The most expensive breakfast I've ever eaten. 50 pounds. 50 pounds and that was back in the nine, early 90s. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot. That is a posh breakfast. That is a posh breakfast. And that was the buffet. I really, really enjoyed that trip and revisiting his old stomping grounds. And I have my own pub story. We were in Woodbridge Town. Woodbridge Town. And Went to the Crown up on the Market Square. It was afternoon. There weren't too many people there. We decided we're going to stop and have a beer and revisit his ye olde times. He excuses himself to go to the loo. I'm sitting at the bar by myself. And the bartender asked me what I want to drink. I'm not a beer drinker, but Baltimore has its own beers and bars and stuff, and they do carry a lot of imports. And I had gotten an affinity for Newcastle Brown. 
So that's what I ordered. Terry is walk, walks back as I'm pouring my own beer, and the bartender says to him, <laughs> that girl knows how to pour. <laughs> Just, I bet you this, felt so proud. This girl right? knows how to pour a beer. You did right. By this time, there was about 10 or 15 guys in the bar, she being the only woman. They were asking questions of when I was there and so forth. And it's been 20 some years at that time. I said, see that picture of the uh, rugby team of the Woodbridge 15? And they said, yeah. And I says, well, I'm number eight. Oh. And they all, oh, you know. So I was a star. There was a Jordy in there, you know, Jordy's from Newcastle. So this guy says, do you happen to know what's in the star, the blue star on the label? And I said, oh, you mean the bridge over the river time? And he goes, good God, man, more than half of England doesn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> And I said, by the way, that bridge was one of our nuclear targets that we practice on called RBS, radar bomb scoring. And we'd go in at 500 feet through Newcastle up the river. I knew it quite well. Yeah. Yeah. I bet he was so impressed. Our next visit was a mutual visit. We again came into Gatwick, but it was in winter time and we weren't in England to stay. We had folks that Terry knew from back in the day who lived in Wales, and we were there for New Year's. That was an interesting experience as far as a different part of Great Britain. They actually picked us up at the airport and drove from Gatwick into Wales. So we drove through the Wales countryside, which, you know, they've got a lot of mining, coal mining and stuff there. So we got to learn things about the hills where that had been mines. The Roman tin and mines. I actually think we saw a little bit more because of the countryside of the Roman aspect of Great Britain because there were old roads and some structures and rails. Uh, rails that had been from the pits that went back to the Romans. You couldn't read the signs because they were in Welsh. <laughs> you wouldn't even know how to pronounce the things. Hey, we got to see where Tom Jones was from. Pontypris. Pontypris. It was just amazing. We were in Pondaren. Far, far out and they had the sheep on the hill. That was on the, the drive into the manor house we were staying at. All these white sheep, and there was always one black sheep. <laughs> We uh, were told as we got out of our car when we arrived to be aware of where we were stepping because they had all kinds of peacocks. There were droppings all over the place and it could be quite dangerous if you slipped on it. <laughs> oh, nasty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We were met by the owner of the inn where we were staying at, and it was an old manor house that had been converted and had an addition that was a hall that they were going to have the celebration for New Year's in. But we were virtually the only guests up until New Year's Eve and then the day after New Year's. We had the whole place to ourselves, and they took such great care of us. And by the way, they had the neatest little pub inside the manor house. Yeah. And walked in there and the man was so happy to see us that he took us on a tour of the pub and gave us a free beer and we're walking up to our room and we see this old lady ironing the sheets and the towels when we got up in the morning she skittle up there and take our sheets off put clean sheets and iron them that's my mum. My mum irons everything, even dusters. Mum, you know it's true. <laughs> Is your mum going to see this? Oh, yeah, my mum will see this. Mum and dad. Yeah, yeah they yeah. will. Well, hi, mum and dad. We've heard a lot about you. We would go in and out, and people would greet us, and they'd ask if we want to open the little pub for them, because we were there by ourselves. They were very, very... Accommodating. Oh, yes perfectly. We went to Cardiff and some small towns. I think most memorable was going to a pub. In Pandaren. It was the Red Lion and they had a graveyard outside across this little road. 1100, 1200 we, we look graves. Like you look and you go, oh, there's got to be ghosts here. <laughs> yeah, I bet. As we're driving up, I happen to notice there's the really old, old building there's the sign above and then there's this area outside in front of the parking we pull up and there's steam rising from the ground and it's peeing on the wall 
they oh. had no oh. indoor plumbing for men. Oh, so oh. the men had to go outside and against the wall. You can see the men's faces from here up. <laughs> and you can see their feet. And there was a trough that the urine was going in. And I'm going, holy cow, you don't see this in, in Tucson, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> my head is doing, where do the women go? Oh my God. What are <laughs> but they had just opened up a restroom for ladies. Six months before. Oh, oh lucky. What happened they had, then? They had big stones on the floor and so forth and a huge fireplace. We're sitting there and Catherine, the barkeep, she said, here, try this beer. This will really get you. Specific gravity. That's how they pronounce how much alcohol is in it. Try this one, <laughs> you know. There was a bunch of guys came in, big burly men, about 20 of them. They were the Welsh national rugby team. Oh! And they were on their way the next day to Dublin to play in the rugby championship. So Georgiana's there. She was standing in the middle of these guys. They sang to her. This is for Georgiana and mentioned her name in Welsh. God, it was really amazing. She'll never forget it. She felt like a queen. I bet oh, you I did. Bet. That's, yeah. that's wonderful, isn't it? I, I, would know, I love an experience like oh, that. So would I. <laughs> oh. So she's the only girl I know that was serenaded by the Welsh national team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> New Year's Eve dinner was done at the manor house. We were in that big hall, hundreds of our closest Welsh friends. You know, it was a dress up affair. Clean underwear. She had clean underwear. Oh, well, always. <laughs> I had on my winter velvets, you know. It was quite an experience when we are having dinner, when the plate of food comes, which was haggis. Did you like the taste of the haggis? I did. I love it. Knowing what it was and looking at it and I'm going, oh, it's not pretty. Yeah. But you cut it open and there you have the meat and the oats and whatever mm. else is spices and stuff. I go, well, how do I eat this? And they said, best way is to put a little bit of the parsnips on your fork and then take some of the haggis with it. And it was mm. actually pretty good. Well, good for you for yeah. trying it, because I know a lot of people won't, so... Have you tried it, Lisa? No, I've never had the opportunity, Me but neither. I would try it. I wouldn't eat it in any restaurant in the States, because they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, yeah. they don't know how to make it. I first had it uh, years prior to that in uh, Dundee. I, I loved it then. And you talk about cold in Scotland in the summer, go to Dundee sometime. We did have the pipes come and, you know, they did form a conga line. Everybody got up and got into this big line and just snaked around and was were singing Auld Lang Syne. We had the bagpipes. It was really very, very traditional. And I have to say, I, I absolutely loved it. And it made, for me, one of my favorite memories of that particular trip. What was an unfortunate thing I found out happened. Our last day or our second last day there, it was just a little bit stuffy in the manor house. I opened the window and a bird flew in and just landed there and then it flew out. I mentioned it to the inn's owner. Oh, he said, you know, here, that means that there's been a death. And I go, oh, well, that's not good. So we end up going home and uh, found out that my uncle had passed away. <laughs> Oh so, gosh. coincidentally, you know, between the ghosts in England and the folklore. That's what I really loved about the whole British Isles, actually. The bottom line is, I loved my tour of duty there. I love the people. It's our, you know, whimmy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been a blessing to us to have had the opportunity to meet you through Roger and you, Lucy, and to have been able to become friends with you. You're actually maybe distant cousins from somewhere because of our joint heritage and, of course, our history.
So we love yeah. you guys. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you yeah. so much. We feel the same, don't we? We do. Yeah, it's, it's always a treat talking to you guys. And this has been absolutely fascinating. We've just absolutely loved having you on the channel. Yeah. So thank you very much. We look forward to meeting up again soon. Thank you.